welcome back to On Time Radio Hour's presentation of Sherlock Holmes and the Kensington Case. This is episode two. Sherlock and Watson have just met the ethereal Peter Pan. At his request, the duo have decided to rescue Wendy Darling from being admitted to an insane asylum. I am currently of sound mind and body is entirely unknown to me, given that I have just met what I had assumed was a daydream a scant few hours ago. I must confess that I am treating all of this like a dream. My normally over-analytical associate, Sherlock Holmes, has taken the whole matter with surprising adaptability. We are casing the hospital in which Wendy Henley, aka Wendy Darling, is being treated. Our plan is to furnish her escape. I say, Holmes. What is it, Watson? Not to put too fine a point on it, Holmes, but have you lost your damn mind? Whatever do you mean, Watson? I mean a boy in green appears above our heads and sends us on an illegal crusade, and you don't even give it a proper chin scratch. What is there to do, Watson? Waste time trying to prove that the boy doesn't exist? And what then? Where would our investigation be? Do you recall me saying, eliminate the impossible, and whatever is left, no matter how improbable, must be the truth? (laughs) Well, of course. I made it a memorable quote in my writing. Well, for the first time in my recollection, I believe the truth lies somewhere in the impossible. But how can you say that, Holmes? Moriarty. What? Moriarty has set this fantastic engine to motion. Whatever plan he has hinges upon the impossible daydreams of traumatized children. If we are to find the truth, we must travel through the fantasy and witness the impossible at work. I need not know how Moriarty has achieved these illusions to withstand them, but by following whatever foolhardy plans Moriarty has for us, I can map out the true nature of his plan. So, are you saying we did not see a flying boy a few hours ago? What we saw is most certainly what we saw, and rather than waste time trying to uncover how what we saw was possible, We need to pay attention to why we saw what we saw. Rescuing Wendy. Precisely. She must play heavily in this plan. And while Moriarty would naturally assume that we would spend our time chasing flying boys and confusing street urchins, we shall do the one thing he'd never expect. Oh, what's that, Holmes? What he asked us to do. So we're to free Wendy from the confines of this hospital. Indeed. And then what? Protect her with every resource we have. <laughs> Our resources are somewhat limited these days, Holmes. We've been away for some time. Don't bother me with trifles, Watson. I am formulating a plan. No, quite right, quite right, Ralph. We stood before the hospital another half hour while Holmes concocted a plan that employed the use of disguises, subterfuge, distractions, and a well placed fire. I followed Holmes into the hospital. He was masquerading as a doctor. Despite my protestations that I could, in fact, impersonate a doctor quite well, He found no resistance or even suspicion as we walked the halls of the hospital, winding around to Wendy's room. Holmes entered the room, silent as the grave. Mrs. Henley? Who's there? A friend. Mr. Holmes? Remarkable recall, Mrs. Henley. Please call me Wendy. As you wish. Dr. Watson and I have come to take you away from here. Has John changed his mind? (laughs) Hardly, but we must get you out of here before they transport you. I shouldn't leave. I fear that you are the center of a complicated plot. The death of your husband and the abduction of your daughter are only the beginning. Oh, poor Jane. There, there. We'll get her back. We stand a better chance of finding Jane if you are helping us. Finding Jane? I know exactly where she is. You do? Of course. Aboard the Jolly Roger, in the clutches of Captain Hook. Oh, this again. I know full well how insane that sounds, gentlemen. But I also know full well that it is the truth. Surely you understand that not all truths are so easy to digest. Some truths are downright poison, but that they don't fit into a wider definition makes them no less true. We will find whatever truth, however palatable, is behind all of this. That much I assure you. Thank you. Now, if you wouldn't mind, would you explain why you are so certain of Jane's whereabouts? Why, the letter, of course. The letter? Yes, surely they shared the letter with you. There has been no mention of a letter. John claims that in a fit of insanity I pinned it. But I promise you, I did no such thing. Where would we find this letter? The constables took it. Lestrade. Quite. Are you ready to leave this hospital? Since I arrived. Follow us. I am uncertain when Holmes had pilfered a nurse's uniform, but within moments, Wendy was in disguise, and we were walking out of the hospital. 
Damn it all, Holmes! What about the distractions? The fire? Are you actually complaining about the ease of the escape, Watson? Well, I had expected more of a to-do. Well, if you ever write this down, feel free to embellish a much more exciting escape. Hmm, perhaps I will. <coughs> After swinging from the main chandelier while Windy clung precariously from Sherlock's cloak, the fire I had set was raging towards the children's wing of the hospital. Hmm, yeah. Perhaps I should just stick to the facts. Holmes felt strongly that Windy would do well to get some well-deserved rest. We found ourselves at Mrs. Hudson's door. Holmes, are you mad? Moriarty's henchman keeps a room here. Which is why they would never suspect that we would harbour Windy here. I imagine the whole of London elsewhere is more likely in their minds. What's this then? Our friend here could use a decent meal and a place to rest for a few hours. We will be back presently to retrieve her. I don't rent by the hour, Sherlock. I'll pay a month's rent for a few hours' stay, but in your quarters, not the museum. A whole month? Yes. What do you like for breakfast, dear? Have you any marmalade? Well, of course I do. Watching Mrs. Hudson take Wendy into her flat felt like dropping off a wounded bird with a country doctor, hoping for the best, but a strange sensation that hope is a futile emotion. Where to now, Holmes? The harbour. There's a steamboat captain we need to speak to. Of course Holmes would want to pick up your, our investigation exactly where he had left off. While heading to speak to the steamboat captain, who claimed to have had an encounter with a pirate ship, we were beset upon by none other than Peter Pan. It was easy to find the American captain. We knew two things about him. He was American, and he spent all of his spare time in the pub. What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? I beg your pardon, sir. Is this your ship? I am the captain, but between you and me, I don't own the ship. Did you have a strange encounter the other night? Strange? Strange? Like a pirate ship scraping across my starboard side? I would certainly count that as strange, wouldn't you, Watson? Indubitably. Indubitably, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Who are you guys? I am Sherlock Holmes. What? Sherlock. Is that a name? Yes, it is my name. Sure. Lock. Sure lock. Sounds like something I'd want on my trunk. Better lock up the variables and get the sure lock. Uh, back to the pirate ship. What, if any, details could you give me about the ship? What details? It was a pirate ship with sails, cannons, pirates. Anything else? Uh, look, buddy, I, I love your name and all, but I don't know what you want from me. I am a detective. I'm working on a case of a missing girl. Any details that you can think of, no matter how small, can be of extreme value. Uh, three mass galleon. Beauty, really. I'd say 20 cannons, at least. Only saw two actual people on board. The first mate, a guy named Smee. Seen him around town. He's always trying to give me a fake name. And I guess uh, the captain, he, he had a hook for a hand. Well, what's that now? Yeah, full-blown hook hand. Holmes! I heard. Have you seen the ship since that night? Not exactly. What does that mean? Now, I'm not one for telling stories out of school, and I'm not overlooking the amount of libations I had at the pub, but I swear, I saw it passing by the moon the next night. Uh, well, what does that mean, passing by the moon? Is, is that a nautical saying? Nautical? I'm saying the moon, up in the sky. The moon. You know, you do know what the moon is, right? Well, of course. Well, imagine a ship passing in front of it. Holmes? If you could provide us with the list of the drinks you consumed that night. <laughs> Holmes led me straight from the shipyard to Scotland Yard. He felt that he should be able to get a look at that letter that Wendy mentioned. Of course, we had every reason to believe that the charade we were leading the strad upon would prove useful in this endeavor. You want what? Access to a letter found on the scene. What for? The investigation. I think you're letting this roll, you're playing go to your head. You're not a real detective, remember? No one knows about the letter, so you don't need to see the letter that no one knows about. Well, yes, well, I... Uh, how do you hear about it, eh? You know the whereabouts of Wendy Henley. Wendy Henley? She turned up missing this morning. I got every spare man on it. You haven't heard. This is the first I am hearing of it. Some master detective. Here's something you can do. We have a new lead. A weak lead. 
but if you want to look at it and look like you're investigating, I can let you follow up. How very gracious of you. Tis, ain't it? So, uh, Wendy and Lee's older brother, Michael. Turns out he was very close to Jane. Took care of her often enough to make him a suspect in the abduction. What do you mean? Well, he's got no kids of his own, so he's always at the end he's visiting with his niece, see? Maybe he was just tired of being an uncle. <laughs> that is a fairly weak lead. Why, why pursue it at all? Yeah, well, he's the only one at the house when we arrived. He was standing there with the body. Where was Wendy? She was running towards the shipyard in a nightgown. How did Michael Darling find his way to the house before your men? That's a good question. You should try asking him. Quite. Good day to you, Inspector. Try not to make a nuisance of yourself, eh? I wouldn't dream of it. Once we're out of earshot of Lestrade, Holmes pulled me aside. I need to see that letter. What's the plan? Yeah, what's the plan? Oh, great Scott, woman! Where the devil did you come from? That's a long story. You see, when the first baby laughed for the first time, it broke into a million pieces. Now will you hush? We are formulating a plan. Oh, for mutations. What's that? We need to get a letter away from Scotland Yard. What letter? The one found at the crime scene. Oh, was it a Q? What? Q is a letter. My favorite letter. Looks like an O with a tail. No, what we are looking for is a piece of paper with writing on it. Ugh, writing? Why explain it to her? Because Watson, I believe she can retrieve it for us. Like a mission? Like a thing I gotta get done, come hoop or holler? Precisely. We need you to find the letter that was left at Wendy's house. Oh, the one Hook wrote? Yes, exactly, the letter Hook wrote. That's easy! I wish we could say that we saw her vanish. But the truth of it is, uh, one moment she was there, and the next she was gone. There was a distinct feeling that perhaps she had not been there at all. Holmes hurriedly made his way back to Mrs. Hudson's. I thought we were letting Windy rest. Here's hoping she's had enough rest, Watson. <coughs> if we're to speak with her brother Michael, it may prove useful to have her there to fill in the blanks. Very well. Mrs. Hudson met us with considerable amount of resistance when we asked to see Windy. Let the girl rest. Can't you see the ordeal she's going through? We are full aware of her losses. I am certain that the pain of losing her husband and daughter weigh heavily upon her, but we are trying to save her child. You never saw what really matters, Mr. Holmes. I always worried so about you for that. How do you mean? It don't take a genius to see what that she's torn. Nearly in half. Torn how? By what? Honestly, you too. No one can live in two worlds at once. You can try, but sooner or later you have to choose. That girl never made the choice, and she's been pulled apart every day since. What the devil are you going on about, Mrs. Hudson? It's an obvious Sherlock. She left her heart in one world, and the rest of her in the other. I need answers, and you respond in poetry. Maybe if you thought a little more in poetry, you'd see a whole different truth, Mr. Holmes. There's nothing wrong with speaking in poetry. In fact, if anything, there's something wrong in never doing it. What is happening? You go back and rest, dear. I can't. There's too much to do. We must prepare ourselves. Well spoken, Wendy. We must speak to your brother. Yes, we must speak with all of them. All of them? Slightly Nibs, the twins, Toodle. Uh, your adopted brothers. My brothers. Uh, yes, of course. Why must we speak to all of them? Hook will have made contact with them by now. Every case has twists and turns, but I can barely keep up with what we're trying to achieve. I must constantly remind myself that at the center of all this nonsense is a child in danger. Our first stop was Michael Darling's house. Having stayed home from his work at the rail yards, Michael was overjoyed to be reunited with his sister. Wendy, oh goodness, I feared for the worst. John was relentless. I, I tried to convince him of the error of his thoughts. No, no, John was just acting out of his own sense of right and wrong. He is trying, Michael, we must remember that. Do you remember, Mr. Holmes? Not in person. I have read your story, sir, and I am honored to meet you. I know that we have met, but I was uh, three. Yes, we have met. I have questions for you. Anything. How did you come to be in your sister's house before the police? Wendy rang me, hours before the, uh, the crime. Uh, she was beside herself. She was all on about Hook and Peter Pan. You remember Hook and Pan? I can't say that I do. I remember playing it as a child. Michael. I am sorry, Wendy. The stories were fantastic. Adventures, flying, pirates. 
But none of it was real. Not really real. Oh, Michael, I thought you remembered. At least a little. I wish. Sometimes it feels like a memory, but not a memory of something that happened, but rather a memory of something I dreamed. It wasn't a dream, Michael. And now we have to remember if we want to save Jane. What does that mean? How can remembering help her? If it were at all possible, I promise you I would recall the whole of human history to bring Jane home. The world is not brick and mortar, Michael. It is not the iron tracks of your trains. It is none of what we see every day. All of that is merely the colorful wrapping on a gift. That feeling you have of remembering a dream may be the closest you get to what really matters. That is what you must cling to. We must not forget the substance of who we are. I try, Wendy. I try with all my heart and soul. This world will not budge. It will not let me go wherever I please. I am limited. No, Michael, that is my very point. We are unlimited. We have seen the distant shores of Neverland. We know there is more. Don't you see, Wendy? If Neverland truly does exist, and I have truly been there, I was not meant to remember. We were not made to know these things, Wendy. Perhaps there is some magic adventure that every child is allowed to have in the golden hours of one's youth, an adventure upon which we were never meant to cling. I cannot imagine facing the world we live in with knowledge of such fantastical places as Neverland. How poor and paltry this brick and mortar and iron world must look in comparison. But we live here, Wendy. Holmes had more questions to be sure, but he held his tongue. He could see the hurt, and the only salve available at the moment was silence. Whatever aid Michael Darling was to offer would not be uncovered in this meeting. We allowed Wendy and Michael time alone before we set off to meet the first of the so-called Lost Boys. Judge Philip Darling, known to Wendy as simply Tootles. Tootles? Wendy, how many times have I told you to call me by my name? Tootles is your name. No, my name is Philip. You know this. Your name is Tootles, and you know that. Fine, Wendy. I could never out-argue you. Quite impressive, Your Honor, given your illustrious career as a lawyer. Am I seeing things? Sherlock Holmes, as I live and breathe, it was your investigations that first sparked my interest in the law. I am flattered beyond words, Your Honor. No doubt you've been following this case. How could I not? As a judge, I can only pray to see the culprit brought before me. We have every reason to believe that Professor James Moriarty is behind this. Moriarty? Really? Surely he'd be long dead by now. One would imagine. This is the Moriarty who was your tutor as a child? Yes. Remarkable. It's not Moriarty, it's Hook. Yes, of course it is. Don't patronize me. No, Wendy, I received this in the post. Judge Darling retrieved a parchment from his desk. He handed it to Holmes. You are quarterly invited to dinner aboard the Jolly Roger. Brandy to be served at 1900 hours. J.A.S. Hook, Captain. So, you see, Wendy, I do think there is something to your claim. Only, I have seen this handwriting before. Look at it, Watson. Is it not the handwriting of James Moriarty? There's no mistaking his handwriting, Holmes. This was all the evidence I needed to link Moriarty directly with this case. I assure you, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I have seen James Hook's handwriting as well, and there is no mistaking that this was pinned by James Hook's left hand. I've never seen Hook's handwriting for myself. I have to rely upon what I do know. I have studied tirelessly the art of handwriting analysis. I can tell you that this is, without a doubt, the work of James Moriarty. And I find it most intriguing that you would mention that it was written by Hook's left hand as Professor Moriarty is left-handed as well. Perhaps the flourishes created by the left hand create similar patterns. You still haven't explained how a man who must be well over a hundred years old is sprinting around London with a child under arm. I haven't the foggiest notion of how Moriarty is alive, but he has an associate by the name of Mr. Smee. Smee? Mr. Smee is here? Yes. Why? Why, Mr. Smee is the bosun aboard the Jolly Roger. He is chief among Hook's crew members. Smee. Sounds so familiar. Yes, yes, Tootles, try and remember. The pirates. Hook, Mr. Smee, it's like, like I can almost see him. You were there, Tootles. You fought the pirates, remember? Yes, fought with pirates, and you were my mother. Yes. And Peter was my father. Yes, under the tree. What a strange dream. No, no, Tootles, it was not a dream. Of course it was. I cannot fly. No one can. You remembered, Tootles. You did. And while you may think it a dream, it was your own history. 
I can take some comfort in knowing somewhere inside you is proof of Neverland. I believe we should move along. Perhaps we should look in on Lord Charles Darling. Nibs? Ugh, he has been insufferable since marrying into nobility. Nonetheless, whatever designs Moriarty has on your family extends to Lord Darling as well. Holmes, Windy, and I made straight for the palatial estate of Lord Charles Darling, known to Windy simply as Nibs. Windy, dear Windy, so sorry to hear about Edmund and Jane. Even though so high as we must suffer such uncommon tragedy. Thanks, Nibs. Lord, if you please, Windy. Lord Nibs. What brings you to my humble estate? What, what? Uh, my lord, uh, we are hot on the trail of the man responsible for your brother-in-law's murder and your niece's abduction. And you are... Oh, quite sorry. Yes, yes, of course. I am Dr. John Watson, and this is my colleague... Sherlock Holmes, gracious me, I hadn't thought you were still alive. Some nastiness on a German waterfall. Now that was a ruse to confuse my enemies. Uh, well, I'm sure it didn't help your friends any either, what, what? <laughs> Uh, we were wondering if you had received any correspondence signed by J.A.S. Hook. Oh, do you mean the dinner invite? Yes. Oh, I detest invites from strangers. It wasn't from a stranger. It was signed by Captain Hook. Hook? Is he in the House of Lords? Nibs. He took Jane. He ran Edmund through. Ran Edmund through what? What are you going on about? Nibs, listen to me carefully. When you were a child, you fell from your pram, and that's when you met Peter Pan. No, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Please, Nibs, please. You followed Peter to Neverland. Never Neverland, second star to the right. And straight on till dawn. Yes, yes, Nibs, straight on till dawn. Captain Hook has Jane. Yes, we must rescue her. From Hook? Yes. I, I will have to take it up with the other lords. What? I will bring it up before the other lords. We will set a council on the issue and perhaps a vote. No, no, that isn't the way to save Jane. Of course it is. It is the proper way to deal with a sticky situation. You can't have lords running all over trying to right wrongs. That is why we have the Royal Marines. What, what? But Hook. Uh, who? Captain Hook. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I know the fellow. Is he a Marine? Pirate. Ah, uh, hardly. We haven't had pirates for centuries. What, what? Wendy, may I have a word with you? Lord Darling led us to his private study, where Holmes could speak with Wendy in private. What is it that you are trying to do with your brothers? I am sure I don't know what you mean. You are desperate that they remember something that they are determined to forget. You have a purpose beyond vindication at play here. I know that it is vital to Jane's survival that they remember Mr. Holmes. Explain to me why. Perhaps I can help. Mr. Holmes, I have spent my entire life on the wrong side of accusing eyes and judgmental thoughts. I know full well that what I am after is beyond the scope of logical men such as yourself and Dr. Watson. I'd rather keep your eyes kind and free, kind and free and pity. Take that mine again. I'd rather keep your eyes kind and free of pity. Holmes held his words. He saw the pain raging like a hurricane behind her eyes. Without any, me uh, without any means to assuage the storm, Holmes merely touched Wendy's shoulder and nodded softly to allow her to keep her pride intact. Mr. Holmes? Yes, my lord. There is a child to see you. A child? I believe so. I admit I don't deal with children as a rule, but this person seems to have all the prehistoric characteristics of a child. She says she has a message for you. Show her in. Which one of yours is Sherlock Holmes? That would be me. A right and proper lady gave me a pound to deliver this sh to Sherlock Holmes. She said you'd be here. Did she? She did indeed. She said you would be with a fuddy woody doctor and Mrs. What looked like she was sad about something. Hello, Mrs. Hello. What is your name? Sandra. But most folk call me Sandy. Not because I got dirt on me or nothing, just because it's short for Sandra. Only it ain't shorter. Sandra, Sandy, it doesn't sound shorter to me. Uh, back to the lady who hired you, Sandy. What did she want you to deliver to me? The young girl handed over a small piece of paper. I could tell that it was, uh, in fact, a photograph. But I could not make out of whom or what. Sherlock's face went pale, his eyes seemed to gloss over. Watson, what do you make of this? Holmes handed over the picture. It was her. The only lady to occupy any space in Sherlock's mind. Irene Adler. Having died shortly after their first and only encounter, 
Sherlock had held her in the highest regard since. Some thirty plus years ago. It's Irene Adler. What the devil does it mean? Was there a message to accompany this photograph? She's to be at the Savoy at room 111. This woman in the picture? That's her, all right. This photograph was taken over 30 years ago. Go on. I've seen her take it myself. Look there, in the corner. That's me own hand. See, the bracelet there. Holmes and I inspected the picture and both concluded that it was, in fact, current. What the devil is going on? I don't know, Watson, but I feel we need to get to the Savoy at once. I can continue on to my other brothers. Not alone. Tut tut, she won't be alone. I will accompany her and shelter her from any prying eyes from Scotland Yard. What, what? We will catch up with you in two hours' time. Where? Mrs. Hudson's. We'll be there. Um, who is Mrs. Hudson? Holmes did not speak a word the entire time we travelled to the Savoy Hotel. He traced the image of Irene Adler with his eyes the whole while. Sherlock sidestepped the front desk and made his way directly to room 111. I do not know what I will find on the other side of this door, Watson. I have my service revolver, what? Keep a hand on it at all times, but leave it in its holster for now. Right here. Upon entering the room, we were met by the smell of a garden's worth of roses. The lights were kept quite dim. Only a few candelabras lit for mood seemed to illuminate the opulent hotel room. Seated at a vanity was the woman in question, so very much like the deceased Irene Adler that I found myself involuntarily rubbing my eyes in disbelief. You sent for me? I did. <laughs> Why so cold a reception, Sherlock? I am trying to piece together the mystery of you. I doubt you could solve this mystery. Besides which... I would like to think that not all mysteries are meant to be solved. Who are you? You know who I am, Sherlock. I know who you are meant to be, but she died in 1890. I've come to accept that death, while inconvenient, is terribly persistent. Yes, about that. I wasn't killed, Sherlock. I was abducted. By whom? Is this a formality, you asking questions that you already know the answer to? Moriarty. The same. That doesn't explain why you have not aged a moment since last I saw you. Well, technically that is not true. I have been aging every second that I am in London. It's quite amazing, really. I never felt the passage of time so keenly. I have lived in a place beyond time. I never have to fear getting older or losing my youth, my beauty. What madness are you speaking? All those years ago, Professor Moriarty came to me in earnest with an unwholesome bargain. He promised a life of ease and luxury, and not a single finger of that wretched beast time would ever touch me. Of course, he had me living in a cage when he made the offer. I resisted for as long as one can in a cage, or at least for as long as I could. But once I relented, he furnished all that he had promised and infinitely more. You said it was a bargain, meaning you must have promised something in return. Oh, yes. That is what brings us together today. What do you mean? Moriarty expressed to me that I was the only person to ever outwit you. Yes. Which, according to him, made me the only person worthy of your adoration. That is an oversimplification of my respect for you. He dared even say... In your own way, you loved me. In my own way? He, he takes liberties with his assumptions. Yes, I thought so too. But the bargain set was simple enough. I could have my throne in the stars if I would, at his beck and call, return to London to urge you not to pursue a case. Which case? Well, he never specified. He never said what I was to do or why. He merely stated that if he ever called upon me... I would have to come back and implore you. So you are meant to deter me from my course? Mm, I am. And if you fail? I live out my life from this moment forward. I would once again feel the dawn and the sunset as markers to an inevitable decay. Those grand treasures that I have experienced these last decades would turn to ash in my memory. And I would eventually age and die. As you were always meant to. Quite right. 
Is it your intention to use trickery or deceit to keep me from this investigation? Mm, on the contrary. I have no hope of taking you away from this case, and I wish to offer my assistance. What could you offer? A simple warning. Do not think your way through this one, Sherlock. It will do you no good. There is only one way to find the answer for any of this, and it is not in the mind. It is in the heart. You know that is impossible. <laughs> so are flying boys, magical islands, and me, Holmes. Yet we are all here. Irene kissed Sherlock's cheek with the tenderness of a spring breeze upon dandelions. Holmes walked into the hall and out of the hotel without a word. Once outside, Holmes began a furious pace towards Baker Street, but we were interrupted. There you are! Mrs. Bell, you do have an unnerving ability to surprise us. Well, I'd say she has me as jumpy as a field mouse. I got the thing. She held up the parchment just like the ones Judge Darling and Lord Darling had. Is this from the yard? What yard? Scotland Yard. That sounds pretty. Uh, where did you get this? I don't know. Oh, never mind her. What does it say? Wendy, if you ever wish to see your girl again, convince the others I am real. I need new crew members for the Jolly Roger, and only grown lost boys can become Neverland pirates. Yours, J.A.S. Hook, Captain. What does it mean, Holmes? It means Wendy is playing right into Moriarty's hands. You're listening to Odd Time Radio's presentation of Sherlock Holmes and the Kensington Case. Odd Time Radio is recorded live above the Savannah Coffee Roasters every Thursday night in Odd Lot Improv's performance space, The Loft on Liberty. If you're tuning in on the radio or the internet, we are being broadcast on WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM. Savannah Sounding's Community Radio with Global Soul. And now, back to our program. Holmes, the mysterious Tink, and I found our way to Mrs. Hudson's flat, where we waited until Windy arrived. Oh, you beat me here. Where's Lord Darling? He got bored. What? He got bored and went home. What is she doing here? Windy Bird. You know I hate it when you call me that. You two know each other? Well, of course. She's Tinkerbell. So we've been told. What is it? I had thought that you were a victim of a clever trap set by my arch nemesis. But the more I see the whole of this story, you appear more an accomplice than a victim. How can you say that? Firstly, you are the most adamant voice in blaming Captain Hook for your misfortune. He is responsible. And yet you seek to help him get the confidence of your brothers. Your insistence that they remember Hook plays heavily into whatever plans Moriarty has for them. No, you, you don't understand. I know well enough that whatever trauma befell you and your brothers all those years ago was more than likely at the hands of Moriarty. And now, whatever diabolical plan he set into motion back then is coming to fruition here and now. I am trying to fight Hook. And now you confess, knowing this young woman, who has all but proven herself to be an ally of Moriarty in his bid to drive me insane. What? This entire case is riddled with holes. Nothing makes sense. And now that I see it for what it is, it was never meant to make sense. For how could I follow all of these broken paths to any solution? The answer is I couldn't. I'm running in circles while Moriarty makes one deft step after another. The dinner invitations from Captain Hook. They are for this very evening, and I fear we left you to your own devices and undoubtedly who have made certain that your brothers would be in attendance. You're twisting everything around. Am I? I have the letter found in your house. Then you know what I am trying to do. You're paying blood ransom. Your brothers for your daughter. No! What other possible explanation could there be? I alone have held on to Neverland. It burns inside my heart, so much so that I worry that it will set the whole of me aflame. And while the brilliant memories of the island melted away from the Lost Boys, I was burdened with it. And while Peter made regular visits to me, they became erratic and further apart until I was alone with just my memories. Hook is in need of a new crew, but what Hook doesn't know is that my brothers are good, noble men now. If they can remember who they really are, they will fight Captain Hook. Because, yes, grown lost boys become Neverland pirates, but only if they go back to Neverland. While what she spoke seemed to be in a foreign language, Holmes paused to look into her eyes. He sneered a moment and then sighed. 
Where is the Jolly Roger anchored? Oh, that's easy. I can take you. You'll take us, eh? Take you where? Just lead the way. The sun had already set when we came upon the ship. It was a splendid galleon with all the flourishes. To see such a ship is to ache for the open water. It seemed all the more ashamed to have it anchored anywhere. Okay. So we attack. No, we must come up with a plan. Is the plan attack? No, <laughs> certainly not. Oh. I get it. We should wait. Precisely. And attack! The young girl sped onto the gangplank. Holmes reluctantly followed, and I inched my way to the main deck with Windy. The deck was set for a lavish dinner party. The long table was brimming with fine foods and liquors. Mr. Smee was putting forks besides dinner plates. Mr. Holmes, showing up uninvited for dinner, bad form, old man, bad form. Moriarty's voice rang out. I could not see where he was standing. We're here for the girl. Ah, well, had you waited a day, she would have been returned to her bed without so much as a scratch on her head. Mr. Smee, dispatch them. Oh, dispatch? Uh, what's that mean? Kill them. Oh, okay. Wait, who are you? Oh, I'm, uh, John Smith. No, you don't need to use the pseudonym now. You are Mr. Smee here. Oh, right, I'm Mr. Smee. It's me, Smee! No, you're not. Oh, uh, yes, I am. No, Mr. Smee was considerably older, and you have pillows under your shirt. Uh, is she allowed to say that? It's fine, just kill them. Okay. Just kill us, Moriarty? Surely you would want to savor outwitting me? Good Lord, Mr. Holmes, have you always been this self-centered? I know this will come as a shock to you, but this isn't about you, Sherlock. I gave you a way out, sending your dream girl to you, and yet here you are, thinking I'm trapping you. Show yourself, Hook. That's Moriarty. That's Captain Hook. You know, it has recently come to my attention, people actually think my name is Hook. As if I were born James Hook, and then, by chance, I lost my hand and replaced it with a hook. Tell me, do you think Blackbeard's name is Blackbeard? Or Peg-Legged Pete? Was that his given name, and then by sheer misadventure he lost a leg and happened to have it replaced with a peg? You haven't got a hook for a hand. Well, I find it difficult to blend into polite society with a hook for a right hand. But I assure you, once on board the Jolly Roger, I replaced my prosthetic hand with a most glorious hook. Stepping out of the shadows by the helm, Moriarty stood in full pirate regalia of the brightest red, his right hand replaced by a gleaming hook. He cocked his enormous hat and smiled a wicked smile. How is it that you never noticed I had a wooden hand, Holmes? I suppose it is more of that narcissism at work. Uh, am I still killing them or what? What happened to Smee? I am Smee! I mean the real Smee. What is she talking about? It's not important. Kill them. It's important to me. You said I was Smee. You're Smee now. Then who was Smee then? Smee made it to be my first mate, and then he abandoned ship after I killed the last of the crew members. So I'm not the first Smee? Oh, goodness, no. You are the fourth Smee, but by far you are the best Smee since Smee. <laughs> Am I better than Smee? Well, that's difficult to say. Smee was, in fact, Smee, and you are not. Where did you find him? Why is that important? You yourself said only a lost boy can become a Neverland pirate. Ah, yes, quite right, young Miss Good Form. So since last we crossed swords, Wendy, I have been charting the unknown Neverlands. Surely you know that Peter's Neverland is unique in many regards, but far from the only Neverland. Neverlands come in all shapes, sizes, and topographies, and while searching for nautical Neverlands from which to recruit a crew, I found this one floundering about in a distant lagoon. I'm a surfer. I assure you, I have no idea what that means. Cool. <laughs> With the discovery of this, me, I learned something remarkable. And what is that? All this time, I had thought that time had no effect in Never Never Land. But what I learned is that Never Never Land stands in full defiance of time. Each Neverland is from a different time, each one suspended in the stars with no tedious law of science, physics, or logic. That is how I can pass through Neverlands into the distant future or ancient past. But that is why I must have a fully crude Jolly Roger. With it I can set roots that would make me a legend in one culture, a king in another, and a god in all of them. But a captain without a crew, it's unforgivably bad form. 
The low gust of wind passed over the bridge, and a crowing could be heard in every direction. I looked up into the riggings of the sails and saw a shadow passing by. Once I was able to track the movement, I saw the boy from last night flying through the air with a sword in his hand. He lighted on a small handrail leading up to the helm. Huck, it doesn't matter when you show up. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, I'll always be there to stop you. Uh, how is it that I can outsmart the greatest detective and rule over an endless criminal empire, but one boy in tattered tights gives me such trouble? Our game is far from over, Hook. You still have a hand and two feet I can take. Yes, yes, you are a very butchery boy. How long has it been, Peter? Some twenty years since last we danced? Then strike up the band! Mm, proud and insolent youth, prepare to meet your doom! Dark and sinister man, have at thee! Thank you for listening to Odd Time Radio Hour's presentation of Sherlock Holmes and the Kensington Case. Tune in next week for the grand finale. Tonight's performers have been Chris Susie as John Watson, Mark Rand as Sherlock Holmes, Laurie Cleland as Wendy Darling, David Holland Rousseau as Lestrade and Nibs, Travis Spangenberg as Michael Darling, Mike Moore as Tootles, Harmony Kelly as Tinkerbell, Marjorie Ward as Mrs. Hudson, Lillian Susie as Sandy, Courtney Grail as Irene Adler, Trick Kelly as me, Patrick Saxon as James Moriarty uh, Hawk, Bill Cooper as a steamboat captain, and Jin Hee Susiran as Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs>